Time for the salt to be salt. Time for the light to be light. Time for the church to be unapologetic. Time for you to be radical about your belief. Unapologetic. We're not these little soft rollover people. We are here to change the world. I learned today that whatever storm you face, you're still going to face more storms along the way. And that by putting your life in God's hands and just focusing on the Word of God, you're going you're gonna, to um, overcome these storms that, that come your way. Did you know that we have thousands of home cells all over the world? This is where you will be cared for, discipled, but this is also where you will build lifelong relationships and friendships with other believers. So what are you waiting for? Get connected today by simply visiting our website at www.crcchurch.com. And thank you for tuning into our CRC live broadcast. Whether you are in one of our locations or tuning in for the very first time, we welcome you. Yes, TD, and we are going to be blessed with a phenomenal word from Pastor Ut today. But first, let's get up on our feet, let's get ready, make sure we give our best praise and worship. Amen. You heard Angelique. Let's all stand on our feet. Let's give God a praise in this place. Put your hands together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Make some noise to Jesus. Here we go. I was broken, you healed me. I don't know why you loved me so. Lost and you found me. There is no place your love won't go and you never stop chasing. Wash away all my tears, Jesus, you are the reason. Oh.
every other name. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for your presence in this place. James 5, verse 13 to 15 says, Is any of you suffering? Let him pray. Is any of you cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is any of you sick? Let him call for the elders and the prayer of the righteous will heal the sick and raise him up. Tonight, God is in this place to heal you, to meet you at your point of need. That is you. Come to the front. Pastors want to pray with you as we're going to continue to worship in Jesus' name.
Darkest of night, I hear the sound. 
all the gods left and singing, oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. Come on, only the congregation, let's hear you. Come on, all the brothers, lift your voice and say it. Oh, I love you. Come on, everybody, lift your hands and sing it. Oh, I love you, God. Oh. declaration I live for you. Worship him. Holy, holy, holy. Come on, lift your hands to him. Now come on, give him your biggest praise, your worship, your adoration, your acclamation, your exaltation. Come on. Come on, lift your voice and praise him. Lift your voice and give him praise. Come on. Exalt the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Come on, he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Come on, every brother in the house, every sister in the house, come on. If you can shout for a rugby team, you can shout for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, hallelujah. Come on, say, give somebody a high five and say, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. Come on, you are the greatest generation alive in this world. You are going to change the world. You are a bunch of history makers, world shakers, serpent bruisers, devil chasers. Come on, kingdom builders, that's who you are tonight. In the name of Jesus, say amen. Man, praise the year of an arm. I can only own what you think from low pricing and unbidding me. My yake and my gibble and yake and yake, yake and your stem for him. Jy kan God prijs van aan, want God is waardig. Ek sê God is waardig. Halleluja. Amen. Give somebody a high five and say, God has great things in store for your future. And we will. Praise TV, Facebook, um, live, YouTube, live, CRC online. People all over the world, Russia, India, Israel, America, Pakistan, China, Africa, and all over Europe. We welcome you tonight. And of course, all our beautiful CRC churches all over South Africa. We welcome you with us tonight from Bloemfontein, the thousands and thousands there, Johannesburg, Ladybrand, Agenais, Belito, Cape Town, Cape Town, Old Durban, your pastors, Jacqueline, 
Pulse by George, Jeffrey's by Katsu, Kimberly, Clarkstop, Grunstad, Mark King, Malmesbury, come on, welcome to you, super welcome to you, funny workstart, what's in Africa, one car, I'm a sick one car, start the little girl's workstart near from Pretoria, Mumbela, Mumbela, Moy Noy Peril, Peter Marisburg, Polokwane, Port Elizabeth, Potchard, Strum, Rustenburg, Uppington, Val, welcome, Booster, Gabberone, they passed us, yes, well, Pastor JJ Hanna. Building a beautiful building, we'll show you in the offering. To make one diva, Swagman, Van Duke, net on your hook. Yeah, let's have a bye. Welcome for now, Joe. Welcome. God's going to do something amazing in your life tonight. Say amen in Jesus' name. As I was greeting people, somebody came with, with dark glasses and said, Pastor, I heard you last Sunday. I brought my dark glasses because my future is bright in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your seat in heavenly places. Come on, Mr. Soundman. Let's not wrestle one another tonight. Because there's going to be one winner. I want to talk to you. Maybe one of the most important messages that you can understand as a young person. I want to talk to you tonight about the potter's house or the potter's wheel. How God prepares you and God's process for you. To get you to where God wants you to be. And I want to start reading from Jeremiah chapter 18. And I want to read verse 1 to 4. And you can see there's a lot of pots here. And one of these pots represents you. And we have a fantastic lady that's going to help me out tonight. And uh, give her a hand, okay? She's an expert. Um, so she's going to make some beautiful things and I'm going to smash some ugly things, okay? Uh, that's my job. I smash and she builds. No, I won't break your pots. Don't worry. Can I break everything? Anything? Are you sure? <laughs> she says she's thinking as long as you pay for it. Okay. What is your dearest pot? Yeah, I know that it Verse 1, the Bible says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred. The word marred means it was broken, it was damaged, it was deformed. All of us, when we come to Jesus Christ, are deformed, misformed, misinformed, damaged, and messed up. So we need God to do something in us and for us if we are going to fulfill God's plan for our lives. And let me say it tonight, God, while we sort out my sound, God's plan is never your plan. And God's way is never your way. I think this is a good part to break, okay? Not because I'm frustrated, just because I want to break something now. So, um, it says, he made clay, and the clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again. We all were born into this world, and the longer you lived without Jesus Christ, the more messed up you became, the more damaged you are. We all came to Christ as damaged goods. So we all need an encounter with God and we need the process of God to make us the vessels of honor that God wants to use. So the Bible says, so he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. I want to say this tonight to everybody uh, sitting in this place and watching in every one of our other churches in Bloomingdale, Johannesburg, Potsdam, wherever you are tonight, Durban and Khabarone, uh, because your pastors are here, I'll give you a lot of attention. Um, that God is your creator, and God decided. Listen carefully. Without falling off your chair, He decided your biology. You can say Amen. He decided your color. <laughs> Sometimes people say, if I, was, if I was a white man, why do you want to be white? Because black don't crack. <laughs> if I was black, if I was a man, it's a man's world. 
Yes, it is. No, it's not. Actually, after I got married, I found it's a woman's world. It's not a man's world. I thought it's a man's world. Till you get married, then you find out the first few years is a man's world. The rest of it is the woman's world, okay? Um, so, uh, God decided, listen, I want to say it, because we're living in a confused world and we're going to talk about it tonight. Um, God decided your biology, your skin color, black and beautiful, white and beautiful, Asian and beautiful, colored and beautiful, God decided your color. I don't know what's up with white people that they always want to go lie in the sun and, 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 and get brown. Why are we not happy with who God made us to be? Oh, you're a brunette and you, you wish you were blonde. You're a blonde and now you dye your hair as a brunette. That's okay. You know, it's, it, it keeps the husbands um, um, interested. If you change your hair all the time and change your looks all the time, that's okay. We can handle it. But please just stay the same person. Don't lose yourself in the process. Your personality is by God's design. Okay. You are beautiful. Don't let me sing to you now. You are beautiful, my brothers and my sisters, brethren and sisters. You are beautiful. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are God's handiwork. You are God's design. I don't care what the world has said about you, what you've gone through in life. You may be a marred vessel sitting here tonight because you were abused as a seven-year-old girl or a nine-year-old girl or a 10-year-old girl. But I want to tell you, God's going to get a hold of you and God's going to put His hands on you and God's going to heal you. God's going to heal your brokenness and God's going to remake you and God's going to turn you into something beautiful and you are going to glow and represent and shine the glory of God because you are a vessel of honor. There is no mistake. There is no second-rate citizen. You are created by God. You are unique. You are an original. You don't die a copy. So you better begin to love yourself, accept yourself, and stop minimizing yourself, and stop down-talking, and stop uh, 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 doubting yourself, and begin to celebrate who Jesus made you to be. Come on, celebrate. Somebody tonight, just celebrate. And say what David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made that my soul knows very well. Come on, you have to love yourself before you can love anybody else. You have to feel good about yourself before you can make anybody else feel good about themselves. But you ain't going to feel good about yourself until you get into the hands of the master. And until Jesus has his way with your life. Because when you come to Christ, you are messed up, broken, damaged. A lot of damaged people out there that have cracks because they never ever have come to Christ. So I want to talk about the potter, the lady sitting here, God, the clay, you, and the process. Because I think, I think sometimes we get confused. We want to negotiate with God. We, we're not happy with who we are, where we're at. And let me say this. Um, if you have a vision and uh, you believe God's in control of your life, you never are where you exactly want to be because you're always going somewhere. But thank God you're not who you used to be. And thank God you're not what you used to be. And thank God you're not where you used to be. That God has already begun a good work in you. You're a work in progress. The Bible says we are His workmanship, His handiwork, recreated in Christ Jesus for good works which God beforehand has ordained. So in Christ you are beautiful. In Christ you are perfect. In Christ you are justified. In Christ you are righteous. So you have to get onto the potter's wheel so God can remake you, remodel you. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature, creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So you need to accept whom God designed you to be and who God created you to be. And I'm going to say it again. The philosophers of this world do not determine your design. The agendas of this world do not determine your design. God is your creator. Your maker. And you're never going to be a whole vessel until you put yourself in the hands of God. Never. You're not going to find yourself through the love of your girlfriend or the love of your boyfriend. You're not going to find yourself losing yourself 
in the context of what the world says about your identity. Remember the spirit of Babylon is the spirit of the world. And the spirit of Babylon wants to do a few things. The spirit of Babylon, if you study the Bible, wants to, number one, shut down the church. It wants to stomp every trace of Christianity out of planet earth because the church is the hope of the world and the church is the salt and the light of the earth and the church is the pillar and ground of truth. So the church represents truth in society. So when people say in this day and age we have to relook at scripture, they better be careful because the word has stood the test of time. The Bible does not change for any culture, for any opinion, for any agenda. The word stays the same, tested in the furnace of the earth. Come on, say amen today. God's word is still God's answer to the ills and the problems of humanity. God is not going to change his will. No matter how much people debate on TikTok or how many uh, popular YouTube uh, videos people make or what... Um, uh, uh, Talk shows people have about the modern day church. The church was birthed 2,000 years ago, established upon the rock who is Jesus Christ, and is built upon a foundation which is the Word of God. God's Word can never become a debate, never become a negotiation. We all have to conform to God's way if we want to experience what God has for us because God determined your design. Listen. So in Babylon, if you, if you study the history of, of, of Daniel, um, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and 114 years later on Nehemiah, um, you can study scripture upon scripture how Babylon tried to suppress the house of God, close the house of God, and we went through a season of that. And we saw other gods arise and other agendas arise, and many people turned away from the faith. The second thing that the, the spirit of Babylon tries to do, it tries to rob people of their God identity. Because if you doubt your identity, you will doubt your destiny. So what did they do to Daniel? What did they do to all those, uh, those boys? They sold into slavery and they took captive. People don't know this, but they castrated them. Do you understand that? They took their masculinity. They didn't, were not just taken in exile, they were placed with the other eunuchs. That means they were castrated. Their identity, their sexual identity was taken away from them. Because if you don't know who you are, and I understand people go and they wrestle, and there are seasons in people's lives, especially those who are not in the church, where they are trying to find themselves. And they look for answers in the wrong place. And that's going to leave you confused. And I'll tell you this, that God is never the author of confusion. God never ever confuses you. When you get close to God, you see yourself exactly for who you are. You don't doubt who God created you to be. It's the world that casts doubt upon who God created you to be. And that foolishness has now spilled over in our education systems. That's why I tell people, parents, Bring your children to church on a Sunday so they can hear the Word of God. Because they're not going to receive education, identity in the school. They're going to get a whole lot of confusion. Why are you so quiet? You're all awake. We're not going to lose ourselves because of the world. The third thing that Babylon tries to do, and you have to listen to this very carefully. It wants to bring the Babylonian spirit into the church, which is what? Bring the world into the church. Well, we're not talking about your dress, your hairstyle, and things like that. We're talking about what people practiced in Babylon, they tried to bring to the Jews as well. They tried to bring their gods, their morals, their beliefs into the church. Now listen, the Roman Empire, when Jesus was born, was one of the most uh, promiscuous societies in the world. Was one of the most morally uh, decayed, if there's an English word like that, let me make a new word today. I hope there's not one like that, because like God, when I say it, it is, okay? So um, it, it was a, a moral mess. Rome was a mess. As a matter of fact, you could smell Rome from, from miles away because of the stench. And I don't even want to go into the practice. As Paul sets the tone in Romans chapter 1. He doesn't judge the sinner. He doesn't judge the sin. He sets the tone of what Rome was all about. And that's exactly where Jesus Christ is born. 
and in Romans chapter 2, he says, it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. To get rid of sin, you have to get to the Savior. You have to get to the Christ. Otherwise, that sin is going to destroy you. One of the most powerful empires fell because of moral decay. Listen, if Satan can bring moral decay into the house of God, the house of God will lose its flavor, will lose its power, will lose its, 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 its influence. The church has to be different from people in the world. Come on. You can look like the world, but you cannot act like the world. I'm not saying you have to be holy and irrelevant, but you can't do what everybody else is doing in the world. You just cannot. You cannot. You cannot feast at the tables of Babylon and think it's okay. You cannot. I know young people don't want to hear this. They just want to do whatever they want to do and think it's okay. It's not okay. It's going to mess you up. Because the paycheck of sin is dead. The wages of sin is dead. Your salary for sin is dead. No matter how good you feel about it. Talks about the pleasures of sin for a season. So, so, so that's why Satan will do anything to get you to a place of compromise. One foot in the world, one foot in the church. And your greatest power as a young person is your purity. Your separation. That you keep yourself like a Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. That you purpose not to be defiled by Babylon. Come on, is the young person I'm talking at to, to tonight. Stand to your feet and give him a praise like you believe what I'm saying. Like you're going to be a difference maker, a world shaker. Come on. So if you and your boyfriend were sleeping together, tonight it stops. Uh, if you got drunk in the clubs last night, you don't do that again. You're not Babylon. You're Christian. No, you better clap louder than that. So I'm not putting a heavy revy on you, but um, the problem is the world gets a hold of people when they get away from God's process. They stop going to church, they stop reading the Bible, and then the spirit of the world begins to invade those people's lives. Listen to me, young men sitting here tonight. It's not okay that you sleep around with church girls. Let me tell you very carefully, it's not okay. It's not okay that you target church girls and you sleep with them, okay? It's not okay. It's never going to be okay. And I don't want to hear about it. I'm telling you straight, looking at you as your pastor, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear that you target girls in this church and you go sleep with them and you, and you steal their virginity and you break their virginity. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to find you. Listen to me carefully. You're not a virgin stealer. Pass off. You know, be careful, girls, if the guy keeps you till after, after 11. You know, my pastor was clever enough. I lived in his house, married out of his house, and he said, you'll be back 11 o'clock. I was already 22 years old, and all I did was evangelize. He said, after 11, nothing good happens. Because that's when the conversation gets real deep, right? <laughs> the brother's voice. <laughs> the angels. I think we need to pray. Close your eyes and I will lay hands on you. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So thank God He's not finished with us. And as young people, you have time to fix what is broken. You have time to stop nonsense before nonsense destroys you your age you can make work to your advantage by giving God's word your full attention by deciding I'm not going to be like everybody else and I, I said to my girls always because I raised them to be poor pure and I protected their virginity and uh, because I believe it's the father's responsibility to make sure his daughter marries as a virgin. So I had a scanner, which God placed in my eyes, that I could see if there was a fingerprint on my girl's leg. 
Because it, it was something I was committed to. Because as a father, it's my responsibility to protect my daughter from these Christian young men. Uh-huh. That's why some people don't want to come to CRC because the pastor challenges you to change. So they don't like it. They just want to go hop, skip, and jump and never hear that you can't live like the devil and, and feel good about it. You cannot. You, you need to live different. You have to be different. You either are or you ain't. You're either a Christian or you're not. You're either a child of God or you're not a child of God. You have to make up your mind where you stand. So you have to protect yourself. Amen. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you tonight? So you have time for God to fix you. Um, no criticism against um, anybody. Please, girls, don't, don't not hear what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. I speak to you as a father in the Lord, okay? No matter what you have done, in a moment, the potter can restore you, remake you, and make you beautiful and brand new like a virgin again. He can. He absolutely can. If you will repent and turn back to God. So I understand peer pressure that was upon my daughters as well. Um, I mean, when I was a teenager, girls 12 years old were losing their virginity already. People think it's a new thing. It happened in my day already. It happened in the 60s. There's no generation suddenly that's so promiscuous. Generations have always been promiscuous. People have always been promiscuous. Always. Since uh, the first few books in the Bible, it's always been there. And there's always been those that refuse to sell out to the world. I said to my girls, because they were, oftentimes their friends would try and put this pressure upon them that they did not date boyfriends. And they felt like, oh, is there something wrong with me? Because no boy is even asking me on a date. No, because the boys were looking at who was standing behind them, and that was me, because they knew I was going to smash them, okay? That's why they were not going to date my daughters. It wasn't an option. So I said to them, you can become like anybody else, not anybody else, but girls that play around in the world. In three minutes, you can become like any one of them, but they can never become like you again outside of Christ Jesus. In Christ, He makes all things new. He will restore you, rebuild you, heal you, and prepare you to be a beautiful wife in the future. But there are things that if... If, if you have bad cycles, you have to get back to the potter's wheel and the potter has to break that cycle. The potter has to break that which has caused you to be broken. The walls that are broken down in your mind, your psyche that is broken down, your need for love by giving yourself to a man, feeling that's the way I receive love, that has to be broken in Jesus' name so that you can live a life of fulfillment for the next 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, as a daughter of God and as a wife to be married. Come on, girls, say amen tonight in Jesus' name. So there's no guilt yet tonight. There's no shame yet tonight. But what there is, there is a potter's wheel, and you have to decide whether you're going to put yourself back in the hands of the potter and allow the potter to fix you so that you don't live your life like a cracked vessel, a broken vessel. It's a lot of broken people that get married. People that are broken. Holes in their souls, okay? Not these souls. The souls are here. Broken vessels. And in a marriage, two halves don't make a whole. You need two holes to make a whole. That's what a marriage is. So we need to get rid of the brokenness. We need to get rid of the cracks. The pots that are full of cracks. It looks okay but it's filled with cracks. We need to get rid of it. We need to get ourselves whole before God. Are you listening to me? This generation needs to get themselves whole. You need to love yourself the way God loves you so that that handsome dude sitting next to you cannot exploit you with his words and with his compliments. You need to get yourself whole before God. You need Jesus to heal your broken heart. You need Jesus to break your heavy burden off of your life so that you can love yourself, so that you can accept yourself, so you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't need anybody else to affirm me. I've been affirmed by my Father in the heaven. 
in Jesus' name. And all my sins have been forgiven. My past has been erased. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I have a future and a hope. And you carry yourself with dignity. And everybody that tries to exploit you, you give them, speak to their hand. You block them. You delete them. You don't even lower yourself to have one conversation with fools like that. Are you listening to me? When the pot is whole, there's no entrance to mar that pot again. But you have to find your wholeness in Christ first. Every brother, every sister, everybody sitting here tonight has a story. I don't know what it is. Maybe your parents went through a divorce. Maybe you went through abuse. Maybe abandonment, rejection, whatever it is. Everybody has a story. That's why God, when He deals with man, He doesn't deal with symptoms. He deals with cause. He deals with the root. He deals with the heart of humanity. He takes out the heart that is broken and He heals it. He takes out the heart of stone and He gives you a heart of flesh, a heart of feeling. He first works in you, then God works through you. And that means you have to willingly, listen, place yourself on the potter's wheel. Not... Um, have, have you seen the clay jump off there tonight? No, it hasn't. Um, huh? Can I break that? Okay, let me just break anything. So, uh, and I'm going to break something. <laughs> I'm not going to break something. I'll be, I'll be good. I'll be kind. I'll be nice. Okay, we're going to talk about fixing. So uh, let's talk about this process of the potter quickly. So um, you have to rest in the process, which is his process, not yours. Because God knows what he is doing. You don't. God's timing is perfect. Yours is not. God knows what he is busy doing in your life. You don't. You have to accept what God is doing and trust him. You have to let go and let God. And that's difficult. Because we like to be in control. And we like to fix ourselves. And then we mess ourselves up even more. So Isaiah 54 or 64 verse 8 quickly. He says, but now Lord you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. And all we are the work of your hand. Romans 9 verse 20 and 21 it says, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay? Lift your hand tonight and say, I'm exactly who God intended me to be. Say it tonight in Jesus' name. So to the confused in the world, there's a scripture for you. The confused YouTubers, the confused podcasters, the confused opinionators, the confused culture shapers in the world, the agnostics of the world, the people who say there is no God. God has a scripture for you. And I want to give it to you in your face. It says in Isaiah 29 verse 8, And surely... You have things turned around. That's God talking. You think you're in control. But one day you're going to find out I'm God and you are not. You have your opinion. One day you're going to find out your opinion means nothing. Because you will stand before the glorified Christ. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Shout amen in Jesus name. He says to these people all over the world, people that are trying to reshape the agenda, people that are talking about a new world order, that are trying to reshape our beliefs. But listen, I'm a Bible believer. I say it again. I'm a Bible believer. Call me a conservative, narrow-minded person. I choose to believe the Bible. I choose to build my life on solid ground. I choose to build my life on the Word of God. I choose to raise my children on the Word of God. I choose to hold the values of God's Word dear. I choose to believe that God's Word is the foundation of all truth. Not some truth, all truth. All truth. 
originates from the Word of God. As a matter of fact, when you study history, you will see all cultures are shaped on the foundation of God's Word. All cultures. People have turned away from God, but their culture still stands on the Word of God, which is truth, which is ultimate truth. So he says, shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? Suddenly our government doesn't want to talk about God. Suddenly our education uh, 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 specialist, whatever you want to call them, wants to take God out of the equation. Suddenly there are things that come from the West financed by America and Canada brought into our education system to, to confuse our young people. More than ever, we have to teach our children the Bible. We have to teach our children at church the Bible. We have to teach young people the Bible because what they're hearing at school is absolutely rubbish. Half the time, it is going to confuse them and leave them in a chaotic mess. He says, shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? For shall the thing, I like God, the thing, say to him, not the thing say to the thing, the thing, the dust, <laughs> the dust, because from dust you came and to dust you will return, buddy, I don't care how big your ego, the worms are going to eat you one day, you will return to dust if your family doesn't burn you and put you in a little box of ashes. But God is everlasting. God is. God is the great I am. God doesn't need your vote to be God. God doesn't need your agreement to be God. God doesn't need your validation. God is God all by Himself. And the truth is, this amazing God loves you. This amazing God believes in you. This amazing God wants to heal you. This amazing God wants to put you on a road of hope so you can live the future that God has for you. But you have to get yourself to the potter's wheel where you have an encounter with God and God can fix you up. Because we're all in a mess until we come to Jesus. And even after that, we a continual work in progress. And we get back to that potter's wheel all the time, and we stay on the potter's wheel until God makes us who He wants us to be. You jump off prematurely, you're going to have to go back, buddy. He says, you present your body as a living sacrifice. God doesn't want a dead duck. He wants a living sacrifice. He wants your free will, where you put yourself in His hands. That's why accepting Christ is the highest privilege and honor that you have as a human being. Where you say, Jesus, with your will, with your intellect, with your heart, your faith, you believe, you say, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I surrender my life willingly to you. That's what gets you to heaven. Nothing else. So he says, for shall the thing made say of him who made it, he did not make me. Well, who made you? Now, I spilled out on some red rock. I'm an Amobia Proteus, and, and over millions of years, I developed and grew little fingers, and then a little fin, and then I swam for a bit, and I grew a tail. And uh, so why have you stopped evolving? I know some of you are, but I mean, why have you not evolved any further in the last 6,000 years? Because 6,000 years God created you in His image. And we are exactly the same for the last 6,000 years. So everything else is, is, a, is a bunch of baloney. Listen to me. It takes more faith to, create, to believe in evolution than to believe in creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God created man in His own image. It, 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 it takes faith to believe that God made you. And He did. He's your creator. Or shall the thing formed say... Of him who formed it. He has no understanding. I mean you listen to these YouTubers. And you listen to these people that have these talk shows. It's like suddenly God doesn't know what he's doing. For the first time in 6,000 years. We are so advanced. That suddenly God. Who is omniscient. God who created everything. God who weighed when he created the earth. As the greatest scientist ever. Just took a piece of sand. And a piece of water in his hands, weighed it, 
and decided how everything can be. I mean, if it was for gravity, you'd all float away. You'd just all fall off. The earth spinning. You'd all just disappear, float off into the sky, etc., etc., etc. You don't believe there's a God. The Bible says, the fool says in his heart there's no God. Because it's not a big bang. God created the big bang when God said in the beginning, let there be light, and there was light. God created everything, okay? So, he's your creator. He's your maker. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. And for the first time, suddenly, and I, I listen to these people that are influencers, and suddenly they want to tell us, Christians and the rest of the world, that we have to rewrite the Bible. First time in 2,000 years, the Bible is not relevant because we are so advanced in our thinking and so advanced in our understanding that there's no place for God's Word anymore. I put it to you, it's a major spirit of deception that wants to take away people's morality, confuse people concerning their identity to stop the greatest revival that God has intended on planet earth, but he will not be able to because when that devil comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord is going to lift up a standard against him and the church is going to push back. People are going to push back and people are going to stand up and God is going to be glorified in Jesus' name. So, so, so please, don't be a rollover. Be a Daniel, a Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Not that judges other people. I'm not against people for anything they believe. But your belief is your belief. Don't impose your belief on me. I mean, the amazing thing of these people is that they are intolerant of our belief. But we have to be tolerant of their foolishness. Right? Now, when you get into a debate, you never judge anybody, no matter where people are, what people feel, what they believe. It's, it's their personal thing. But they cannot impose that on society. Jesus never imposed himself on anybody. As a matter of fact, he says, I put before you life and death, blessing and cursing you choose. He never forces himself on any human being. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life you choose. He says, whoever is heavy burdened, come to me and I'll give you rest. He gives you choice. Everything about Christ is choice. You choose whether you're going to follow him. He doesn't grab you by the scruff of the neck like some of our parents did when we said a wrong word and washed your mouth with sunlight soap. How many of you ever had that? Yeah. He said, you're a young man, you don't know anything. You're a big man. Your maat jou gevat as jy vloekwoord gesê, dan sê jou mond gewas, man, sê maak oop. Wat was hy aan een rooi sweep gewees wat hulle gebruik het? Wat so goed? Love boy. Not a lot of love in that. Right? Maar hulle was dit uit jou bek, ach, uit jou mond uit. Hulle was skrop jou ma jou mond, skrop om, skrop om, skrop om, skrop om, skrop om. Sê raai sunlight sweepie tussen jou tanden. Sy krij die vloek uit jou uit. Want sy weet het gaan jou vernietig. Nee. Sy kon het nie uitkrij nie. Maar sy het probeer. She didn't just leave you. I mean, I had the most amazing mother. I mean, all my friends feared her. Um, and somehow she always knew where I was. <laughs> we would sit in her house bunking and all be drinking, etc. And yes, she would come with her green Peugeot. And everybody would, your ma, your ma. It's like... Everybody would run. I mean, everybody. If I was in a club somewhere, two o'clock in the morning, and my mother heard about it, she would come, my mama, and she would come and look for her boy. As drunk as I was, as messed up as I was, she came to fight for her boy. She came to fight for her children. When my sister lived in Hillbrow, and she, she was bound by, and, and I mean, we come from intelligent family, good family, etc., but we lost our way, okay. Uh, she drove to Hillbrow. Now, in those days, okay, Hillbrow isn't now what it is now, but in those days, uh, I went there on a binge as well for a week, and my mother came looking for us, couldn't find us. But then eventually she found my sister and dragged her into the car and dragged her home and brought her back to save her girl. Now, that's what my mother did. But you know, God's never going to come and grab you by the scruff of your neck and drag you to church or drag you to the potter's wheel. God's going to love you 
touch you with his presence, then give you the option whether you will choose him or whether you will walk away from him. So he's the potter, we are the clay. The problem with many, many people are they jump off the potter's wheel before the potter is finished with them. They get tired of the process. It's taking too long. They don't like what God is doing. But God's busy doing something beautiful which you cannot see. God is busy shaping you into something. God is busy getting the lumps out of the clay so that you can be a vessel of honor. God is working you, purifying you, refining you. So it means you have to trust the potter. You have to trust the process. You have to trust whom God created you to be and accept it and stop thinking if I was like her, if I looked like her, if I uh, had her voice. No, you are an original. You need to find yourself. You need to discover yourself. You need to love yourself. You need to celebrate yourself in Christ so you can be everything God created you to be and nothing less in Jesus' name. So you have to allow Him to use you as He wants to use you. And sometimes in being used by God, we feel abused. But every vessel has a function. I mean, imagine your coffee cup complaining in the morning and says, you've now made coffee in me a hundred times or a thousand times. No, I bought you to be a coffee mug. Be a good coffee mug and shut up and just allow me to drink my coffee. So you may sit on the, on the, on the worship in the band and after three years you feel, I need a sabbatical. I'm sacrificing so much for God. No, you have the honor and the privilege to worship in the house of God. And even if nobody says thank you, you need to realize as an usher, as a camera wo woman man, as a sound man, that that is your function and you have to celebrate it that God is using you in His house for His glory. You're a vessel of honor. So let's talk about the process quickly in a few hours, okay? Because I know you have a, a huge appetite for the Word of God. Number one, the clay has to go to the wheel. That means... On the potter's wheel, you lose all power. Whoops. We don't like that, do we? That was good. On the wheel, we learn to die. Not easy, is it? Because we were all taught how important we are, and especially us millennials, not us, you. And... Um, uh, you know, whether, you, whether you, you get a reward for everything, and that's fine. We will reward you for everything. But you still have to go to the potter's wheel, where the potter is going to work on you, and it's going to be painful, and it's going to be a process. And it's going to be a making, and then when you don't allow him to work, he has to remake you, flatten you, remake you, flatten you again, remake you. So, so sometimes we determine the length of the process. Our submission to the process determines the length of the process. Because we don't want to die. We don't want to die. We just want to be saved and we want to be the greatest directors that ever the, the world ever saw. If you're going to be a, a director of a great company, there's going to be a process involved. There's going to be a lot of hardships. There's going to be a lot of rejections. There's going to be many battles you have to face. That's why the vessel has to be made. The vessel has to be purified, but at the same time, the vessel has to be made fireproof. Because whenever God uses you, you watch any musician, any actor, actress, any sportsman, and I stand shocked sometimes, where somebody does a brilliant performance and you watch the comments, how people criticize them. I think, what kind of person are you even to go on social media on somebody else's page and you put a negative comment on somebody else's page? The girl sings, she gets the award and you get a, 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 a woman of the East in Pretoria, Frodes von Eastern Pretoria, and they'll make a comment about her hair or they'll make a comment about her dress. Get over yourself, lady, and just celebrate her greatness, celebrate her talent. And put your little fingers away of always having to make a negative comment about somebody else. Because when you always listen, say negative things about other people, 
you are telling everybody else you don't have a good self-image, you feel bad about yourself, and the only way you can feel good about yourself is to say bad things about other people. You pull other people down thinking that that's going to elevate you. That's why people criticize other people. The only reason. There's no other, other reason in the world. If you feel good about yourself, you celebrate other people. You don't pull them down, you celebrate them. You say, that was great, that was a great job, well done. Because you're secure in yourself, right? So John the Baptist said, I must decrease that Christ may increase. Jesus himself said, John 10, 12, 24 to 26, Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, choice, it produces fruit or much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves him, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, I love this. Him, my father will honor. If you follow God's process, then God's, the father will honor you. And God will bless you. And God will promote you in his time. I want to say that in his time. Because sometimes we think we're ready for something and we're not. The minute we go out there in the world, we are going to get broken. Huh? Right? Ready to glaze. There we go. I chose the smallest one. It's the least amount of money. Okay. So um, that's how we are. We get out there in the world and we shat it. We don't get the job. We don't get the interview. We don't get the... We go into deep depression because we've never gone through the process. Because we sometimes want to preempt the will of God. I've seen how many people called to the ministry, great preachers, but they're not ready. They go and start a church and, and, and they go nowhere because they jumped off the wheel or it was never their design. Now listen, God determines your design, not your prayer life. Your prayer life... Is your, 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 is your consecration to the will of God. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. God is not your servant. He's the potter, you are the clay. You find out your design, you find out your destiny, then you submit. Your greatest prayer that you should pray is the prayer of consecration. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. Because if that's God's plan for your life, it will be blessed. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. It will still be a process, but you will have the grace for the process, okay? You step outside of God's grace, you are gonna struggle a lot. Because if God has not designed you for it, it ain't gonna work, honey. It's not gonna work. You can pray till Jesus comes back, but you're not gonna run the 100 meters in under 10 seconds, weighing 350 kilograms. It's not going to happen unless the uh, anointing of God comes upon you and your name is Elijah. You're not going to play in the basketball team if you're five foot two. No matter what angel appeared to you in your bedroom. Maybe as the ball boy. Amen. Your design is a clue to your destiny. Your personality is a clue to your destiny. Everything about you is a clue to your destiny. That's why you first have to discover yourself in Him. Because when you find your maker, you discover yourself. And then life becomes easy. But there first has to be a death. There first has to be going to the, to the potter's wheel. Matthew 16, Jesus said, verse 24, Therefore Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Not something we like to do, right? Social media especially, people don't deny themselves. They just talk about themselves. Notice me, I'm great. I'm great, I'm great, I'm great, I'm great, I'm great, I'm great. Yes, you are. But it's not your time to shine, honey. It's your time to be silent. It's your time to learn. It's your time to grow. It's your time to become. If anyone desires to come after him, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What is the cross? It is not my will be done, but thy will be done. It sounds easy to say it, but it's the most difficult prayer that you can pray. Because you have to submit. We're not taught to submit at all. 
But you want to follow God's process for your life, you have to learn to submit to God's word and to God's will for your life. He says, for whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So on the potter's wheel, we learn to let go and let God. We allow God to smooth us out, to remove the lumps, the bumps, the character flaws. We learn to consecrate ourselves to the potter's will. 2 Timothy 2 verse 20 and 21, the Bible says, In a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. Now you sit there and you say, Ah, I'm just a vessel of clay. Let's continue to read. Some for honor and some for dishonor. It doesn't stop there. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor. God wants every believer to be a vessel for honor sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Say a good amen tonight. Amen. Number two, from the wheel, you are placed on the shelf. Oh, we don't like the shelf. Because we come off the wheel and we look good. We feel, oops. Alice is no naughty so. We feel ready. We look good. I feel good. We feel ready. But, 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 something is lacking. We haven't matured. We have the potential. We have the design. Everybody can see the potential. But premature release will cause you to self-destruct. So you're 19 years old, you want to get married. Maybe you're not ready to have a husband yet. Maybe you first have to develop certain things. Maybe you have to deal with certain character issues. Otherwise, your marriage is going to be a nightmare. Come on. You're not ready to be director of that company. You first have to learn to clean your car, clean your house. You first have to learn to get up early in the morning. You're not ready. We can all see you have the potential, but the potential is not good enough. You need to go through the process. You need to go through the process of purification, of refinement. You need to go through the process of being placed on the shelf. Oh, we don't like this. I've been singing in the choir for three years and I've got the best voice in the church. I have all this potential and nobody notices me. Now I'm going to go do my own thing. And you self-destruct. Because the potter has power over the clay. The potter determines the process. You never promote yourself. Somebody else takes you off the shelf. You can never take yourself off the shelf. Joseph never took himself off the shelf. Pharaoh said, go call Joseph. Get Joseph out of the prison. Joseph's time has come. Although it was the Lord, Joseph didn't buy a microphone and go. Joseph was faithful. God was with him. Joseph was on the shelf. Joseph was in a prison. Joseph had a great dream. Joseph went through a journey of betrayal. Joseph went through a wilderness experience until the time came for God to promote him. Your day of promotion will come. But my dear brother, my dear sister, you are first going to be placed on the shelf. And I don't know how long that's going to be. I don't know how long the maturing process is going to take place. But everybody will be shelved. You're ready for the big time. And God goes silent on you. I mean, I was ready to change the world. Um, I got saved. Um, I was in the ministry for two years and had this vision to be an evangelist and preach all over the world. And I uh, was going to join Peter Pretorius Ministries because I'd never understood these things. Nobody taught it in those days. And, uh, and then God spoke to me and he said, you ain't ready. And uh, he sent me to Lady Brand for six people. My vision was... I want to change the whole world. I want to preach all over the world. I see stadiums and all these things that God says, Nebuta, wilderness view, desert. I was in Lady Brand five years. Listen to me, everybody that's in the ministry. People in the ministry, two years old, they call themselves, or two years in the ministry, and they call themselves spiritual fathers. Man, jy is nog nat achter die oore. Jy weet nog nie wat een geestelike pa is. Nie, een geestelike pa is iemand wat 20, 30 jaar in die bediening is. Jy word nie een geestelike pa nie, want een geestelike pa is soos apostel. 
There's a senior bediener. Nobody is a, a spiritual father. You, you, a brother in that church. So um, I was two years in the ministry. Then in Lady Brain, built that church. I came back to Bloom. And then God said, now your preparation is over. Seven and a half years in the ministry. God said to me, now you're entering your first phase of the ministry. Not, and I was preaching people getting saved, etc., 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 but I was not standing in an office. I was being prepared for an office. And when I went to Bloemfontein, the anointing world came upon me, everything changed. There, there was the, the potential was there, the fire of God was there, but I wasn't standing in an office. That's why it grieves me when every young person calls himself a pastor and every young girl that marries a person in the ministry is called a pastor as well. It's totally wrong. The doctrine is wrong. It's total wrong teaching. It's not correct. It's not accurate at all. I don't care how beautiful the vessel is. It, it has to mature. It has to first go through the process. It has to go through testing. It has to go through the wilderness. It has to learn how to be humbled. It has to learn how to live dependent upon the grace of God. Are you listening to me tonight, young people? Please listen. Because if you use this vessel, it's going to break. Maybe not now. Maybe we can pour wine in here four or five times, but then it's going to break. The wine gaan dier cijfer. Hy gaan dier cijfer. Things are going to cipher through. There's an English word like that. Things are not going to work because you've not gone through the process. So please hear me. You can never reclaim the ownership of your life. I'm saved now 40 years. I cannot now come and say I've served the Lord for 40 years. Now I'm taking the ownership of my life. The day you do that, you're in trouble. You can never, ever, ever, ever reclaim the ownership of your life. Paul the Apostle says, I die daily. Every day you have to die to yourself. Every day you have to say, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Every day you go back to the master. You go back to the potter. You allow him to do further work in you, etc. If, if there's a little uh, 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 paint off of you, then the paint has to be uh, uh, placed on you, etc. It doesn't make sense to you tonight. You preempt God's will, you will get yourself in trouble and you prolong your wilderness experience like Moses, who was called as a deliverer, raised as a deliverer. He preempted the will of God, and he put himself in the wilderness for 40 years. Never was God's plan for him. 40 years in the wilderness. Because he never went through the process. You don't study today and tomorrow you, you're a heart surgeon. You have to be qualified, gain experience, to become that top doctor that God called you to be. Same with a businessman, same with building a great church, drawing people to your ministry, doesn't mean you've stood the test of time. There's nothing like the test of time. So if, if God blesses you prematurely, you can miss out on God's character forming. Your ego, your pride becomes too big, and it's a matter of time you're going to come crashing down. So you have to walk accountable and learn to live humbly before God because that's what the wilderness is all about. The wilderness, and it's something we all have to go through, or the shelf experience, is where we feel abandoned. It's where we feel God has placed us on the shelf. We're ready and God's not releasing us. And I have to say this, be very careful who you talk to when you get a bee in your bonnet. If you're doing something, like let's say I'm pastoring these churches now, okay? And next Sunday I announce, no, I'm now going to America. And uh, I'm taking over Rick Godwin's church. Amen! I'm gone by the end of this month. Hallelujah! How many of you are going to believe that's God? Why? Huh? Why are you looking at me like I'm talking French? Why wouldn't you believe that's God? But if you come with your nonsense, why must I believe it's God? That's a weak hand clap. Don't even do that, please. So in the world, I'll be finished now. Um, in the wilderness, you discover valuable things. You learn about yourself. You learn about God. In Lady Brand, I thought about quitting all the time. Do you believe that? Yes, I did. Every Monday, I wanted to quit. I felt like I'm wasting my time. I was frustrated. I have a little bit of intelligence. And I thought, what the heck am I doing in a little stupid place like this? It's not a stupid place. It's a blessed place. What am I doing here? Every Monday I thought, what am I doing here? I'm quitting. 
and I would go pray, and then every Monday I would resign from quitting. Until I was at the place where God knew I wasn't going to quit. Then God called me to Bloomberg and I say, I'm not going. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm telling God. He wakes me up two o'clock in the morning. He said, I've told you. I said, okay, Lord. I said to Noretta, we're moving to Bloomberg. She said, okay, Lord. <laughs> so the wilderness, listen, always stands between you and your destiny. Always. When God took Israel to the promised land, and I want to close, uh, shorten this to close, the Bible says the reason He took them in Deuteronomy 8 verse 2 was to humble them. Humility. Living dependent upon God's grace as your only resource. True humility. Accepting God's will for your life is final. Not debating with him. Submitting. If it's to be a doorkeeper in the house of God, it's yes, Lord. He says he took them through the wilderness or he placed them on the shelf to what? To test them. Test what is in their hearts. To know what is in your heart and to see whether you would keep God's commandments. Because it's in that place of abandonment that we can lose ourselves. It's in the wilderness that we can run back to Babylon. It's when we feel we do not have value that we can go back to seek significance somewhere else. Every young man will go through that. Whether you're a businessman, 23, 24, 25, 26, maturing from a young adult to a man taking responsibility is a difficult season. You go through that. And when you're in the wilderness, you need few voices, not many voices, because voices will confuse you. They will lead you astray in a wrong place. That's why you need to stay close to God. As we see Joseph, while he was going through his wilderness experience, the Bible says the Lord was with him every time. The Lord was with him and the Lord prospered him. So you will always see God's grace. You will always see God's presence. And you will always see that God has not abandoned you in the wilderness. But you have to learn the valuable lessons. Ultimately, what God is trying to teach you in the wilderness, that man shall not live, read it, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, that you will build your life on God's word and God's word alone. You will not build your life on anything else. That's why you have to come through the process where you are stripped from your opinion. You are stripped from your self-belief. You are stripped... You first, the layers first have to be taken off of you before the layers of Christ can be placed back on you. And it happens in the wilderness. We don't want to hear it. But everybody goes to that place if you are going to reach your destination. And uh, initially when God led Israel from Egypt to, to uh, the land of Canaan, remember it was going to be a journey of seven to eight months where God wanted them to learn these lessons. They could not. So a whole generation had to perish so the new generation could learn that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You build your life on the word of God. You build your life submitted to God and to God's process. Every day of your life, you live in submission to God as your father, to Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Say amen, young person. Not at times you reclaim the ownership of your life, but you learn submitted. In the process of God and serving the purpose of God, because the vessel that God makes is for His glory. That's why sometimes we have to be remade because we think it is for our glory. No, it's not. We are merely a reflection of His glory. So when you're a great rugby player, God gifted you, God talented you, but it's for His glory. You're a great athlete, He gifted you for His glory. A great soccer player, for His glory. A great speaker, for His glory. A great businessman, for His glory. Not for my glory. We don't reflect ourselves. We radiate Him. That's why there has to be a process, right? Where we are stripped of ourselves. Can you handle this? So that we can be fireproof. So that when the attacks come, the criticism comes, the persecution comes, and it will. 
No matter what you do, where God takes you, the higher you go, the more people will criticize you. When you stand at the top of the mountain, you're unfazed by what people say because you have been handcrafted by God and you know exactly who you are. Nothing can faze you and nothing can shake you. Because you do not play to the praises of people, you pray for the audience of one. You pray for the audience of God, and you love to glorify Him, and you love to stand before Jesus one day to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And then the final thing that happens, and we'll talk about it next week, is you go to the fire. The vessel, when it thinks it's ready, goes through the fire. The process of purification where God burns out the hay, the chaff, and the stubble, and God burns into you the image of Christ, and God makes you fireproof, where this world no longer has a hold on you. But you live free, and you live in victory, because that's God's plan for each and every one of you. Do you believe it tonight? Do you receive the word? Give the Lord a praise. Come on, everybody. Come on, praise Him like you mean it. Come on, vessels of honor, vessels of honor, vessels of honor, fit for the master's use, vessels of honor. That's who we want to be, vessels of honor, where we submit ourselves willingly, we give ourselves willingly, we submit ourselves willingly, we yield ourselves willingly, we present ourselves willingly. Amen. Uh, Take your seat, we're going to pray. Um, I thank God that at a young age I had enough common sense not to listen to people who were well-meaning but were not God-sent. That's a deep statement. I actually say a lot of deep things from here that because I talk so quick, it just goes over your heads. You say a lot of profound things. You have to go actually listen to my message slow forward. I'm telling you, because if you listen to half of what I said, it'll change your life forever. So I had a lot of people in my beginning years, formative years, uh, when I was in Lady Brand, and also in the place of total frustration, I had people come in a a little bus, travel to Lady Brand, all business people, 134 kilometers from Bloemfontein. Uh, We are now going to come to this church every Sunday because God's hand is on you and you're anointed. And we're going to support your ministry all the way from Lady from Bloemfontein. And I thought to myself, you can't find a, perf- a church in, in Bloemfontein and you want to come to Lady Brand? I don't want you. And I told them, I don't want the offering. I said, you live in Bloemfontein. If you can't find a church in Bloemfontein, then this is not the church for you. They never came back. Praise God. Because they were people with their own agenda. Then another group came to me. And some of them were my relatives. And said, come start a church in Bloemfontein. Come start a church in Bloemfontein. We've gathered like a hundred people. Come start a church in Bloemfontein. And I'm sitting there with a few people. I'm thinking, Bloemfontein. Yeah, half million men, sir. Lady Brown, three men, sir. <laughs> Thank God I never obeyed them. I never followed their desire and their agenda for me because if I had done it, I wouldn't be here today. Listen to me very carefully. I had to stay in Lady Brand. I had to stay. I had to work through my frustration. I had to work through my wanting to quit. I I had to go through the process to become the person God needed me to be 40 years later. I had to go through it. And the only way is going through the wilderness and going through the fire where you learn to die so that you can live the resurrection life of Christ where no matter what comes your way, you know that God is in control. People, this is very powerful because we're not taught this way. We're taught that it has to be feel good and if it feels good, it's God. No, not always. As a matter of fact, very often when it's God, you do not feel good. You hit the floor and you heil snot and trana. You repent. You cry out to God. You, you, I'm not saying that you sin conscious or you become wormy. 
But this theology that if it's God, you have to feel good. Where is that in the Bible? Do you think it felt good for Jesus to go to the cross? The Bible says he sweated great drops of blood. He said, Father, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He don't feel good about it. He wasn't just, hey, Peter, let's go to the cross. I'm going to die for the whole world. Beep, 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 beep. Nothing about it felt good. He wanted to avoid it with everything in him. But he paid that price because of his love for you and me. And he laid his life down. And we are called to lay our lives down for Christ and for the cause of Christ. And never take our lives back. Never take ownership of our lives back. Ever, 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 ever. We stay on the potter's wheel. We stay in the potter's hand. We listen to what God says and God never changes His mind. Come on. We stay in the process. We stay in the furnace. We stay for the cause, for the duration. We stay for the glory of God because we have been placed on this earth for the glory of God and for nothing else. You need to hear me tonight if you plan to last. As many people start in their 20s, very few still serve God in their 60s. You want to be the generation, Generation Z, that serves God for a whole generation. You want to serve God when you're 40. When you marry a guy one day, you want him to be in church with you. You marry a girl, you want her to be in church with you. You want to raise your children in the house of God. You want to raise your grandchildren in the house of God. You want to do it differently. You want to be people of God. Come on. And you have to make those decisions now as young people. Today. Not three years from now. Today, while you have time. You make the decision. To give your life to Christ. Stop messing around. Stop playing around. Stop committing yourself to something and three months later it's no longer convenient. Then you bail out. It's a bad pattern. Especially if you're a young man. Stop that nonsense. Amen. I love you enough to really be truthful. Because this life, you have to live a certain way if you intend to stay strong and last the course. Stay the, stay the race. You have, to, you have to be very different, very determined, very focused. And tonight you have the opportunity. Your life has been messed up as a Christian. Sometimes as Christians we have to go back to that potter's wheel. I'm telling you. Because we jumped off or a boyfriend took us off. Or a girlfriend took us off. Or a friend that got offended took us off the potter's wheel. Right? Uh-huh. Somebody with a well-meaning opinion. Peter said to Jesus, No, Lord, you can't go to the cross, Jesus. He said, Get behind me, Satan. You don't savor the things of God. Get behind me. Some of you have to go back to the potter's wheel. You have to surrender your life to Christ or re-surrender your life to Christ and get back in the process of God. That girl that you've been dating have taken you away from God. That boy is the biggest problem with young people. It's relationships. You get back to God. You look at the world and you think Babylon has something for you to offer. Tell me what. Shout it out. What? What does it have for you? What? It will leave you hollow, empty. It's going to destroy you. How do I know? Because I live there, man. You can party all night, put a smile on your face, dance all night. You climb in bed. No matter who sleeps next to you, you still wake up alone. And you still think, what the heck am I doing? Because every human being has a need for God. You can try and drown that need out by avoiding church or avoiding worshiping God. But the vacuum is going to grow bigger. And the bigger that vacuum is going to grow, the more Babylon is going to call you to fill that void. You make a decision tonight to put yourself back on the potter's wheel because your maker, your creator, your father is loving, caring, merciful. That is not a wheel of judgment. One day when we stand at the white throne judgment, it will be a, a, a throne of judgment. Now it's not. Now God gives you an opportunity to repent. 
to get yourself back to the potter's house, to get yourself back to the potter's wheel, and to give yourself back to Jesus and say, here I am. Maak eens ek wat jou vriend langs jou dik die man. Toe ek gered is, het my twee beste vriende langs my gesit. Nie ever laat laar te vir julle gegeen nie. Hulle levens het een gemors uitgedraai, al twee van hulle. Al twee van hulle. Selle woord gehoor, selle dag gewees, al twee van hulle kon levens vir die heren gegeet. Een moes vlug uit die land uit, as gevolg van die dols is wat hy aan gejaag het uit, in een in 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 land gebleef oor die derig jaar, want um, hulle wou hom doodgemaak het. Hy het die dag in die kerk saan my gesit, hy kon sy leven vir die heren gegeet. Hy het gekies om het nie te doen, hy het een moordenaar geword. Mense doodgemaak. Dis hoe sy lewe verkeerd gegaan het. Because like me, he had an extreme personality, he went the wrong direction. You can't have a certain personality and not follow Christ. You're going to self-destruct. You'll destroy yourself. This is not something you can do part-time. You do this full out. You give yourself to Christ. You surrender all to Jesus Christ. There's no half surrender. There's no half measure. There's no every now and again church, Christianity. It's not in the Bible. You give yourself to Jesus. There's young people here tonight, if you don't give your life to Christ, maybe somebody hires you a year, two years from now to go kill somebody for 500 rand. These are realities, okay? Realities. Been a pastor long enough. Seen a lot of things. Seen the seriousness of moments like this. That this determines everything about your life. Whether God has you or whether you have yourself, you have a choice. I want every head bowed, every eye closed, no one moving, please, tonight. You can give yourself to Jesus. The potter is waiting to heal you, to remake you, to reshape you, to make you into something beautiful. But you have to be honest and give yourself back to Him. Put yourself in the potter's hand. You say, Pastor, tonight, no one moving, please. I'm ready to put myself in the potter's hand. I'm ready to surrender my life to Christ. I, I want to get back to the potter's wheel. I've jumped off that wheel. For whatever reason, it doesn't matter. It's not a wheel of condemnation and judgment. It's a wheel of invitation where He calls you tonight. There in Bloemfontein, in Johannesburg, here in Pretoria, in Durban, in Cape Town, in Potsdam, in Gaborone, in Vintuk, all our beautiful churches, people all over the place, God talking to you tonight. Give yourself back to Jesus. Give yourself back to Jesus tonight. Give yourself back to Jesus tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed, you say, Pastor, God's talking to me. I want to give my life back to Jesus. Or I want to give my life to Jesus. If that's your desire, quietly, wherever you are, just slip up your hand. I want to say a prayer for you quickly. All over this place, raise your hand up. Raise it up, raise it up. Thank you, God. Bless you, bless you, God. Bless you, many hands. Raise it up, raise it up. Raise it up. Come on. Raise it. Raise it. Raise it. Raise it. Say yes. Include me in that prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Raise it up. Forget your friends now. Forget those around you. He's calling you to the potter's wheel tonight. Tonight you say, I'm coming. I'm coming home. I'm putting my life on there. People abused. People misused. Young generation. Young girls. Raped. Little boys molested. Now men sitting with that anger. Guy in America recently killed his parents and somebody else. And his excuse was, because I was molested as a child and nobody ever did anything about it. Carried that anger all the years. And as a 40-something year old, he went and killed everybody. Carried that anger for all those years. You don't have to carry that anger. God knows you've been hurt. God knows you've been broken. Give yourself to Jesus. Let Him make something beautiful out of your life. Before I pray, you've not yet raised your hand tonight. God's talking to you. There's a stirring in your heart. Lift your hand up tonight. So I'm ready to give myself back to Jesus. Lift your hand now. Come. You have not yet opened your God praat with you. As a bullying up there, tell your hand up. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Ander. Will you stand with me, please, in this place, everybody? All the well-abled people. That's 99.999% of you. Just stand with me. No one leaving now. In all our churches, Bloemfontein. Johannesburg, all the churches tonight, you want to give yourself to Jesus, put yourself on the potter's wheel, surrender your life to Christ, I want you right now to do something. I want you to take your personal belongings so it doesn't disappear, get misplaced, meaning get stolen, and I want you to leave your seat wherever you are, don't think about it, walk to the aisles on the side, walk to the steps on the side, 
And you're going to come here to the altar tonight and you're going to give yourself to the potter. Yeah, it's going to take courage, but that's your choice. That's your decision tonight. Your life is going to change. You're not going to stay in your seat. Maybe you should put your arm around your friend and bring your friend to the potter's wheel tonight. You come to Jesus. Let Jesus do something new, something special in your life tonight. You come. There's no condemnation. There's no judgment. The love of God awaits you. The mercy and the grace of God awaits you. You come tonight. Come on. Come on tonight. Let's clap, clap, clap. There in Pretoria or in Pretoria, Johannesburg. Walk to the altar there in Bloemfontein. Come on tonight. I'm telling you, God is calling some of you to consecrate yourself to Christ, to come back to Christ, to give your life to Christ. Don't stay in your seat. Don't let the person next to you intimidate you. You walk for yourself tonight. You come to Jesus tonight for yourself and receive God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness. And you leave this place changed, touched by the grace of God, forgiven, cleansed, washed, purified. Come on, many, many more of you need to leave. Leave your seat and walk tonight. Come to Christ. Come to Jesus tonight. Come. Come on, young person. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Mana can fully your work and means as a heart of an old moon. You are too much. Nice to God for now. Kom naar die altaar toe vandaan, net soos jy is. Net soos jy is. Plaas jou leven in die hande van jou skepper. Plaas jou leven in die hande van jou saligmaker. Kom vandaan. So I'm excited what God's doing everywhere, but that Johannesburg church really is exploding. Uh, look at those souls getting saved there tonight, and then also the morning services there, etc. Is um, we're going to break that place way open. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing when God works in a place because people are hungry. Um, leaders, leaders, leaders. We need to always um, stay in a place of brokenness and a place of surrender. Otherwise, God can't work through us. We always have to live dependent on God's grace and on, on the presence of the Holy Spirit if we are going to lead God's flock. You can never serve God for gain and never serve God for ego. We are servants. And all the pastors that serve in all the CRC churches, you are there to be servants of Christ. That's it. Strong, confident, but humble servants of Christ. You and your wife. Confident, strong servants. Do not allow people to give you titles and call you things prematurely. It will destroy you. It's a culture that's wrong, that comes from the West, that's unbiblical, which I will address in our movement. It's not okay. A lot of things I see on social media is not okay. 
It's not biblical. It's not aligned with scripture. We'll set things in order and build according to God's pattern. And you don't need a title to turn a city around. You just need to be a man on fire, a woman on fire. I mean, when, when I am in the world, and especially in the gym and travel, etc., I never tell people I'm a pastor. I tell people I, because I do other things as well. I don't just do ministry, like, almost 0% of my time. And then when people recognize me and find out I'm a pastor, they think, gee, you should not be a pastor. What the heck is a pastor in any case? What must a pastor look like, huh? Jesus was man. So, so, so all these people that carry these titles of bishop, apostle, prophet, I mean, you're 23 years old and you're a prophet and your wife is 21 years old. You don't even know what time of the day it is and you call yourself a prophet. Please, just get over this nonsense. Get over this nonsense. They didn't walk around and call Jesus prophet Jesus. Apostle Jesus, please. They just stop this nonsense. Stop it. A young generation has to show respect and honor to a generation that's ahead of them. That's why we allow people to call us pastors, etc., etc. Because familiarity breeds content. It's the only reason. But when I'm out there in the world, people call me my first name. I don't need somebody to call me a title. Actually, I don't like it because it pulls a gap in me. Mama, do you know when you're 20 years old, you say, I'm going to stay with you. Because then you're going to be on your own. Because it's not going to work. Your love is not going to work for a second. It's going to work. Ons nie dier mekaar raak nie. En ek het broeder noem nie. Ek is nie jou broeder nie. Toonig jare gesê, broeder. Ja, boetie. Nee, ja, snuiter. Ja, naad achter die oore. Moet ek so met jou praat. Asseblief. Asseblief. So while we respect those in honor, let's understand that what I'm preaching tonight is very applicable for those in the ministry, that you need to be that vessel of honor that God can use and stay in a place of brokenness and a place of sacrifice so that the sound that comes through you is the glory of God, nothing else. Never become self-important. Never. You never strut the realm. Please listen to me. It's not our culture. It's not something I'll tolerate from any young pastor. No matter how God blesses your church, I wouldn't tolerate any of that nonsense will not tolerate it. It's not the example I gave you. It's not an example I will tolerate from any person. It's not who we are. We serve the people. We love the people. We thank the people. The church is because of the people, not because of you. Don't forget it. And you don't need people to tell you how anointed you are. Please. It's the biggest nonsense in the world. You're not the most anointed person in the world. And if people start writing that on social media about you, you know that they're setting you up for a fall. Absolute nonsense. So don't let people boost your ego because they set you up for your downfall. So your staff that's blowing smoke up your backside, tell them to stop it. Stop that nonsense. Stop it quickly. Because Satan is going to exploit your ego and it's going to be your downfall. You need to go back to the potter's wheel, some of you. Yeah. It's a long journey, this. Long journey. You still have 30, 40 years ahead of you. Stay humble. Stay with your feet on the ground and serve God as a servant of Christ and a servant of men. That's it. That's who we are as CRC. Okay? Donkey. Put your hand on your heart. Pray with me, please. Everyone, pray this prayer with me all over the church. Pray this tonight. Say, Lord Jesus, I give myself back to you. I surrender my life to you. I believe with all my heart, you are the Christ who died for my sin. I believe you rose from the grave. and You are alive tonight. I open my heart and I invite you to take your rightful place as my Lord as my Savior. Please forgive my sin and heal my heart. Thank you for doing a new thing in my life tonight. I receive your grace by faith 
and therefore I know that I am saved because of your love and through what Jesus did for me. I'm born again. I'm heaven bound. I'm forgiven. My past is behind me. My future, I embrace ahead of me through submitting my life to you, Lord Jesus. Now please lead me and guide me and make me the vessel that you want me to be. I surrender all to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Now, please, we want to pray for you. Give you a Bible if you don't have a Bible, because this is a journey, and we all need to walk with other Christians. So thank you for being here tonight. We love you. So if you will turn to my right, your left, you in Pretoria, in Johannesburg, turn to my right, your left, in Joburg, and in Bloemfontein, turn to my left, your right, and in all the other churches, follow the pastors. Come on, look at all the people getting saved in all the churches. That is amazing. Thank you, media. That's Johannesburg. Let's show Bloemfontein. Let's go. Praise God. Amen. Amen. That's amazing. Week after week after week, we see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people getting saved, coming to Christ. Amen. I know you want to go, but it's not time to go. How many of, of you need to leave immediately? Uh, you have an appointment somewhere. Meaning you've got ants in your pants. Huh? Okay, come on, let me see. As you know, on Friday on Kastane Dalso in the in the in the in the Groen Bijvelde, um, and you had now three glasses of uh, wine gehad or five beer. It is now eight in the evening. So you know, I used to go on it. As the orchestra now net begins to spiel. Nee, you so nie. So want to meet you again. Nee, my kinders must school to go tomorrow. My kinders must Friday on. Okay, nee, I must school to go on it. I think we just have to worship, um, just for a moment, and respond to what God is saying to each and every one of us individually. Whatever it is, I don't know. But just a moment where you forget everything, everyone, and you forget about the traffic now getting out here. Because if you watch a cricket match and you know your 300 beer gehad, then what do you need to do? You need to be full of the Holy Ghost and stop thinking about this natural things more than your spiritual life. So let's spend a moment in worship. We're going to sing that first worship song that we started with tonight because it's applicable to the message. And let's just worship Him for a moment. It's not going to be long, just a moment. And you just come tonight and recommit yourself to God. Whatever it is that God wants from you, you surrender your life to Him. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Amen. Give you all I am. Wanna hear your voice as you speak to me. In the secret place where I feel your love with an ending grace, you reveal. Oh, oh. 
just one more thing, please. Just lift your hands like this. Just there and say, not my will be done. Your will be done. You are the potter. I am the clay. I submit myself. I humble myself to your process. Thank you for your grace that will sustain me and for your spirit who will lead me and guide me. Father, my greatest desire is that my life would be to the praise of your glory. Help me to live for your glory and your honor. I therefore present myself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. This is my calling. More of you, less of me. For your glory, my life will be in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, give him praise. Give him praise. Because I'll tell you, when you put yourself in the hands of Jesus, he's going to take you places you never thought possible. He's going to use you like you never imagined possible when you put your hands, when you put your life in His hands. There's no telling what God will do with your life if you stay in the process. No telling what God will do. No telling. God never takes a life down. God always takes a life up. But God says to you and me, you first humble yourself then in my time I will lift you up our job is not to seek exaltation our job is to humble ourselves and to exalt him and that doesn't mean to be little wormy Christians not at all it means to live confidently in the process reliant on God's grace wherever you may find yourself trusting that God is in control and will get you exactly to the right place. Amen. And amen. God bless you. Take your seat quickly. Um, for the offering tonight, um, I, um, we're not receiving an offering for their building, but I want to show you what Pastor JJ and Hannah is doing in, in Khabarone. It's amazing. They're building a building cash in Khabarone, 3,000 seater. So we want to... Um, that's amazing. Maar die gebouw is verder as dit. Nee. Is die dak al op? Nou, kom wees hulle nou. Al, daar sy. Daar sy. Come on, man. That's amazing. Come on, that's amazing. It's a three, how many thousand seater? Three thousand seater. The building is opening when? May, so uh, yeah, that's fantastic. People all over South Africa, uh, we are proud of you. And you're doing it undercover. God's going to bless you. Um, God's going to give you tremendous influence. You have it already. You're a beautiful couple, and uh, you are actually what I talk about. Want jy kom daar uit wat se wêreld uit? Waar sy dorp? Nie mans al weet wat dit is nie. Maar dit is wat, dit is Godse humor, nee. Hy daar wat daar uit die, uit die woestijn gaan haal. Waar was jou woestijn? Is letterlijk die woestijn daar in Namibia. Wat was het gewees? Gaat so goed? Karasburg. Hey. Karasburg. Wie van jullie weet was Karasburg? Wie was al in Karasburg? Wie wil, wie wil een vakantie in Karasburg toe? From Karasburg to London. Where you met... Your beautiful wife, and you fell in love. A rechter Afrikaner, want jylle in Namibiers praat van sy sekere manier. Dis is nie kritiek nie. Toe trou jy a Engelse vrou, wat nou Afrikaans kan praat nogal. En die heren roep jylle terug. And that's what I talk about, the process serving God in London, being faithful in the church, serving as a home cell leader, going through the process, coming back and starting a church in Namibia in um, 
Onker Diva. Ek wil nie van die plek hoor nie, want dit is dier my gedagte, dit is slechte gedagte, is al die goeders. O, jy wel, dit is all bad memories. Plus, but thank God that you went and you started the church, and then God called you to Gaborone, Gaborone, and you've been there how long now? How long have you been married? Ja, jy kyk vir jou vrou die hele tijd, jy doen wat elke man doen, dit is verskrikkelijk, ek wil, dit is verskrikkelijk. Hoe lang is jy getrouwd? <laughs> ek het nie vir jou gevra nie, Anna, ek het vir JJ gevra. And that building is opening in May. We are very excited about it. You are a beautiful couple. You're a great example of strength, leadership, and building a church in uh, Gaborone. I know God is going to favor you greatly. He has. Um, that's why I say if God is in something, then it will work. That building is opening debt-free, not a same debt. I think we can praise God for that as well. Amen. So amazing. Amazing. Amazing, and uh, I thank your members, those that have sacrificed to make it possible, because just like this building, the churches and ministries are built on the sacrifice of people, people that love God enough to give their finances for God's kingdom. You know, when you love God, the first thing you surrender is your money. You can't be in love with God and you hold on to your money. The two just doesn't go. So, on that cheerful note, you are going to have the opportunity to worship God because our giving is an act of worship. Don't because it's the end of the service and you're tired and people have got saved, you think, ah, just get it over with. It's not a just get over with. It's a very important moment. In the New Testament, Jesus sat and he looked over the offering and he saw what people was giving into the offering and he commented on what people was giving into the offering. That's Jesus, New Testament. He looked and he commented. Yeah. This is a new Bible. This is not CRC doctrine. Nie. He said, many who had a lot gave, but a widow brought two mites. He said, she gave more than everybody else. He made a public statement on people's giving. He said, now, do you think he's not, he doesn't see what we give? Of course he does. Because your hand is an extension of your heart. This costs you nothing, except if you had a shoulder injury. It's a bit painful. But other than that, it costs nothing. When you give finances, it costs you something. So be generous when it comes to your finances towards God's kingdom in Jesus' name. God bless you as you give tonight. I know it's late. No, it's not late. It's quarter past eight. That's not late. Okay. So uh, we listen to an anointed item while we give. Please remain seated for security reasons. Thank you. May the rain, so when it falls on me, should I complain? Or fear you call on me, it's all on me to stay. And really catch what you're showing, it's my roots that you're growing, cause life is more than this moment. You are the light, and when the darkness falls, the greatest heights, they never seem so tall, not at all, you're right. It's my roots that you're growing, don't want to miss what you're showing. Ain't no doubt about you, everywhere that I go, you keep showing. You're the smile on the face of your boy You're the flowers in the pot so beautiful You're the word that purify those who join This makes some noise Oh, you cover me My defender when you're rolling up your sleeves You're the truth that's gonna set the captives free The only king that's ever chose to lead That's what I believe But they keep trying to make your glory
the sunshine above me Lord, I love all the way that you love me You're the good, you're the good, you're the goodness Whoa, Through the good and the bad and the ugly I can still feel the sunshine above me Lord, I love all the ways that you love me You're the good, you're the good, you're the good You're the good, you're the good, you're the good, you're the good, you're the goodness. You're the good, you're the good, you're the good, you're the good, you're the good. Ain't no doubt about you. Everywhere that I go, you keep showing up, Lord. You make me want to shout it. Oh, you're the goodness in my life. And I'ma tell you my truth. Baby, come, baby, go. God for talent like that in the house. Just give them another hand clap. Amen. Let's just close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. An amazing word that is going to touch us, change us, set us free, and liberate us to change our world. Thank you, Father, that tonight we go out with a battle plan to win our world in Jesus' mighty name. And come Sunday next week, we will see the lost saved again and again and again. And we will see this building too small. We declare it and we thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we had to give into the offering tonight. And everyone says amen and amen. Family, bring your world next week. Let's fill this building in Jesus' mighty name. Travel mercies. Hallelujah. Time for the salt to be salt. Time for the light to be light. Time for the church to be unapologetic. Time for you to be radical about your belief. Unapologetic. We're not these little soft rollover people. We are here to change the world. Bro